to welcome everybody to Bainbridge Arts and Crafts today, where we are very honored to have Lauren Scruggs and Max Grover here to talk about their work and backgrounds and um, all that's gone into the making process for each of them. Um, so uh, my name is Deborah Rosinski. I'm executive director here, and it's really my honor to have them both here today. I can kick things off with a question maybe for Lauren. I, I heard an interesting story last night um, about the uh, King of Hearts piece. If you care to share that, it was sure. really a wonderful story. Thank I don't know you. if you've heard the story, Max. It's no. It's sort of a, a long story, so prepare yourself okay. to settle in. <laughs> so the, um, the rat was an inspiration from this experience I had when I was in art school. I was driving along and I see this rat crossing the road, and I was like, whoa, the chicken crossing the road played out by a rat. I'll see what happens. So I pull off to the side, and I'm looking over my shoulders, and I'm watching this rat. And he's crossing this like four-lane byway. There's like two lanes this way and two lanes this way. And he gets to the middle of the road, and he goes into traffic, and then he goes back to the middle of the road, and then into traffic, and back to the middle of the road. And I'm just like, oh, he's going to get killed. i got to save him. So I get out of my car, and I'm waving off the traffic that's approaching me. I'm like, out of, you know, go around, go around. I'm walking over to this rat. So I walk over to the rat, and I'm like, off the road. And he goes arcing back into traffic. So I run over. I'm like, no, no, off the road. And he goes arcing back into traffic. I'm like, oh, fine. I've got to save him. So I grab him by his tail. And I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> so I quickly run to my VW bus, and I throw him in the car. And then I'm like, I can't drive around with him in the VW bus running around. So I grab a container, put him in it, put some books on it, and I continue on about my journey. And then I go home and I'm like, well, we live in this like bowling alley apartment, my roommate and I, and I'm just like, there's one room, one door, which is to the bathroom. So I like put him in the bathroom on the counter and I set him up, put a note on my door. It's like, Laura, there's a rat in the bathroom. Don't let the cat in. And, um, and I go back to school and talk to people about this rat I've discovered. And they're all like, oh, I didn't bite you. And there's all these stories that come up about it, you know, rabies. And it's like, and I'm like, yeah, what am I going to do? It's a rat. I'm in art school, so it's kind of cool to have a rat. Um, but I'm not really into taking care of the rat. And I can't let him go in the country because he's a city rat. But so I'm still just in this question of what to do with my rat. So I come home, and my roommate is in her room and she's sitting in bed and she goes, Lauren, I go, yeah. She says, you know your rat? And I'm like, yeah. She goes, well, it got out of the container onto the counter and jumped into the toilet and drowned. And I'm like, <laughs> oh no, I was trying to save him from the road. He was going to kill himself there and now he's dead. And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's in the toilet. And I'm like, oh, right. I'll go deal with it. So, you know, Rats are disease ridden, the toilet's disease ridden, death is disease ridden, there's no way I'm touching it now. So I grabbed some chopsticks, picked them up, threw them in the toilet, threw them in the garbage, and that was the end of the rat. Until I made the King of Hearts, which is after, you know, the deck of cards, there's a king who has a sword going through his head, and people have referred to him as the suicide king. So, hence the King of Hearts. <laughs> So, so uh, along that line, one of the things that inspires me is things that happen in my life or, or scale. Scale is another thing that I work a lot with, like the scale of a bottle cap. What can it do? It can make a whistle or it can be like the wheels of certain things. So, yeah. You know, how, that's a, brings up a great thought of where do you get your ideas? Where do they come from? And, you know, why, you know, I heard that writers write what they know, painters paint what they know. So um, from looking at my paintings on the wall, what do you know about me? You and like um, what, do you, what do you know about Lauren from what, what she creates? I mean, it's, it's actually very revealing um, what we do. You're, and when you have one of my paintings in your home, you really do have a piece of me at one time in my life. Um, so I am always on lookout for, um, for ideas to, um, to make art, 
from or concepts. I haven't picked up any rats on the freeway though. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, 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 maybe I've shorted myself by, by not doing that, but uh, they seem to come. Uh, I don't think I'll ever run out of ideas. I, I keep a list sometimes and um, for a while when I started my painting career, I, you know, before I had a show um, and had to take my paintings down to the gallery, Ten minutes before the show, I'd have to think, oh, what am I going to call this painting, you know, a red car number 30 or something. It was a, <laughs> and it was, I just would torture myself with, what, what do you call these paintings? What do you title them? And then I realized, you know, I could have fun with that. Um, and I would even write the title before I would do the painting. So, mm. you know, what would a painting called drowned rat in the toilet look like. <laughs> you know, that would be enough to generate uh, an image. So I would just write down a few words. Um, and then, you know, when I went back to my list to, to do uh, paintings, then I would look at the thing and that would generate an idea. I paint from my imagination. I don't generally look at an awful lot of, don't have a lot of references for, for my work when I do them, and I find that because of that, I'm much more imaginative. And when I look at something, I tend to be too literal. I, the sky has to be blue and the grass has to be green, so if I just make it up, I, and I like doing that because that's the way kids make art. They don't have to worry about mm -hmm. you know it being um, realistic or not. And I tell my painting st students that, you know, subject matter is just an excuse to do a painting. And that uh, the success of a piece of art really has nothing to do with the subject matter. It's the execution of the idea that is important. How do you get your ideas other than well, driving around? Right. Um, a lot of times it works. I mean, I have a collection of pieces of artwork that I've, of other people's artwork, and I have that as kind of inspiration, then I have my list of things that I've come up with over the, over the years. And um, a lot of times it's just, um, I'll find something and that inspires me. Like, um, uh, well, the yellow, tr the yellow airplane is, um, I saw a wooden airplane that somebody had made and I really liked the way they had handled the the um, wings by scalloping them. So I was like, oh, I want to try that in tin. And then I scaled it based on the um, silly, silly string caps. I really liked the way the tops of the silly string looked. And so that was, um, an ins I mean, I guess it's an inspiration, but it's what I scale things on. Um, like one of my more recent things is a, it looks like a lantern and it was, um, folded bottle caps uh, attached to a, a wine cork with two bottle caps on top and it was based on just the folded bottle cap. I just really loved that look and if I repeated it going in a circle what would it be? So often um, my inspiration comes from um, things that I see and the size of them and how they can relate to other things that I think but and color is also an inspiration and like you said with the childhood uh, childhood whimsical toys are also kind of an inspiration. Um, I, growing up in the 50s, I was exposed to a lot of Japanese tin toys. Mm -hmm. And um, they should have come with a box of Band-Aids. They were, <laughs> they, I was always cutting myself on them because there were a lot of sharp um, edges. I was very excited when we decided that Lauren and I would have this show together. We, um, I'm a big fan of Lauren's work. I have many of her pieces in my house too, um, and because there is such a um, similar look in in a lot of ways, and um, I I was wondering if the materials that you find, the tin that you find, affects the product or what 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 you know if you get a nice 
can of tuna fish or something, does that turn into, um, you know, something related? Right, yeah. Um, sometimes it does. Sometimes, um, yeah, I actually buy tin cans specifically to be using them in my artwork. Um, uh, there is a Sirena tuna that's a yellow can that comes from uh, Australia that um, a friend of mine is always sending me a large quantity of those cans, and those have appeared in a lot mm -hmm. of my works. I did do a gigantic tuna with a lot of um, blue cans and yellow cans from the Sirena. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like the Tiger Bomb, Tiger Bomb Tiger, that specifically came about because I had the Tiger Bomb tin, and I wanted, I was like, oh, I wonder if those would make good wheels on these wooden, so I bought these wooden toys that had these wooden bases and the Tiger Bomb tin worked, went over those wooden wheels. So then I was like, oh, I can make a tiger. So yeah, they definitely influences it. Um, and then just the reuse, you know, the fact that the bottle caps are so easy to come by and being able to reuse them over and over again. Um, you mentioned clever, and clever is something that I'm always trying to um, replicate. Like, I love some of the um, people from other parts of the country and some of their reuse of some of the garbage in their area or the recycled um, reuse of some of everyday products. And I'm always looking for that clever quality that humanity can come up with to reuse something. I think that that might be a, um, a, a common reaction to COVID, what we've done. Mm -hmm. I know that this work is a reaction to my last two years. Um, my work prior to this was much more complicated. I have a, I've gained a real a, appreciation and, and desire to simplify my life. I've cleaned out, like a lot of people, got rid of a lot of things that were no longer of use or they weren't needed. I think the COVID time has given focus on what's important in our lives. So I've tried to use um, up old art materials. Every artist has a pile of art materials somewhere that they've, mm -hmm. they've, they've accumulated but have never used. Um, these are a result, uh, these are trying to use up a lot of older art materials and boards and frames that I've had. So these are really recycled um, materials and ideas too. Do you ever paint over previous works? Yes, and um, there, if you get the x-ray your x-ray machine out you'll be able to <laughs> do some of these paintings and see another uh, latent image underneath of mm -hmm. something else as well that's you know there's a lot of precedent for that in the in the art world so um i i can guarantee you though there's no masterpieces <laughs> under uh, uh <laughs> buried in these paintings though I really like your, your boats here, the, um, the water specifically. And I was thinking that, because that's like, you get inspired. And I'm like, Pat, I'm going to use that, because it's a dark background. And what the little, little tufts of blue on it made me think of was a folded bright blue bottle cap. So I was going to do a, some sort of water scene with a dark blue background and a bunch of bottle caps on top of it. Yeah, you're um, going to be able to create pattern and things by, uh, in a different way than mm -hmm. I, I create it. And mm -hmm. um, you know your material and you probably are always on the lookout for new um, pattern or new uh, color combinations. And, right, yeah. Um, that would be a great way to work. I, my background is in graphic arts. I was a printer, um, off, offset lithographer, and worked with, um, advertising things so I'm always um, enamored with with any sort of um, label or I collect a lot of matchbook covers and postcards and things like that that have a good um, ephemera that 
had somewhat of a um, short lifespan. Mm -hmm. Life, um, and then, so I um, like the things that Lauren uses. The materials they were things that were thrown away for the most right. part. Yeah, I had that same appreciation for printed graphic material. I so, love using yes. that in my artwork. Um, I mean, if um, Lauren was to buy the old, like the Campbell soup can back there, mm -hmm. she'd cut that painting up and <laughs> make it into a rat. Right. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. Just got to figure out how to sew. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> um. One of the questions I noticed, like I do two-dimensional work as well, which isn't here, but so I get different questions with the two-dimensional stuff, but I noticed last night um, a lot of people were commenting on the bottle caps because there's a great deal of bottle caps here. And one of the questions a lot of people ask about that is like, where do you get your materials from? And I used to get them from um, a lot of pubs or bars in town. There's a place in Port Townsend called the Poor House where I get the bottle caps, but since COVID, things change. And so a lot of the manufacturers of beer switch to aluminum cans with, with uh, wrappers. And so I don't even get a printed aluminum can anymore. So bottle caps are hard to come by, but there was a company in Seattle called Ridwell, which they collect things that are not commonly um, thrown. Well, they find places to recycle things um, that have a use. And so some artists actually got together and asked Ridwell to collect bottle caps so that they would be used for artists. And so I've been able to collect large, big quantities of, of bottle caps. And that's one of my sources of bottle caps now because they're becoming less and less. I travel quite a bit to, most recently to Vietnam and mm -hmm. my traveling partner has brought back tiger beer. Um, mm -hmm. That's right. uh, bottle caps for, for Lauren. Got I know me a that. big container of them. Is there any of those in the There might show? be some in the, in the, whist, in the whistles. Uh -huh. There might be some there. But um, yeah, it is off. he had some difficulty getting them to figure out why he wanted them collected. But after a week or so of like, no, save them. <laughs> <laughs> so he came back with this big thing of bottle caps with the tigers on them, which are yes, very and, great and graphic. Bottle caps are one of the things that I um, collect as well, or have collected. I, I stopped um, acquiring things. Mm -hmm. I just uh, I have enough, and uh, but I like the cork ones. Oh, Remember, right. you know when when bottle caps had corks in the back, mm -hmm. and as the kids, we used to take those corks out and then make badges out of them, and and. <laughs> and put them in your shirt pocket and put and the cork, put the cork back in. And right. Was, um, and the, yeah, that was, um, um, there is a, uh, a sense of nostalgia in both of our work, I, I, mm -hmm. I think that, and people, um, you know, they'll look at my cityscapes and this is, been happened many times where they go, you know, gosh, that's that's Detroit. I used to be on that corner, mm -hmm. and um, and it, it wasn't. It just came out of my head, <laughs> I, and I said, sure, whatever, you know. <laughs> <as> I, <laughs> if it reminds you you of something else, then um, all the better. And mm -hmm. but in it reminds me of something, and. Uh, so I, I do the presentation and if somebody else relates to it, and I think that's what, how we connect with art is that, um, it has a familiarity or it speaks to us and, um, that's magic when that happens. There's so many people that I think they're in this world that never experience the joy of being surrounded by um, original art that was created and because of the um, uniqueness of that piece and and then you know you really have a 
um, a little snippet of an artist at one time in their existence. Mm -hmm. Artists are very lucky in that they leave a legacy behind by all the stuff they make. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, their life's work is not documentable or, or it just doesn't um, have a lasting quality. But where art is, it, art is made, it, it's different from that. I have also been a children's book illustrator. And my first book was... Uh, uh, 25 years ago was when it was published. It's still in print, though, which is a good thing, and I'm very happy about that. But those illustrations that are in the book, I couldn't possibly do them now. They were who I was 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I have, you know, there's just no way I can possibly recreate that work um, because it was a... We were talking before, you know, to get from what was to what will be, you have to go through what is. And mm -hmm. these are what, what is for me right now. Hopefully my work won't look like this in 10 years. It sure doesn't look like it did 10 years ago. And, you know, uh, changing your art is kind of like uh, turning a big super tanker or something. It's very slow and gradual. Mm -hmm. But when you can look at something that you did two years ago or five years ago or ten years ago, there is big change. It's more evident. Right. What did your work look like ten years ago? Well, it's interesting because when I was contacted about this show, um, they wanted my three-dimensional work, and I really have not been working three-dimensionally, so it was a bit of a scramble because I had to pull together some old pieces and then I just had to look around the studio and realize, oh, there's 3D stuff around that I've actually done, but haven't really been focusing on three-dimensional. But um, yeah, 10 years ago, it was, it was, I don't know if it was 3D, but it was definitely, in the past, it was more three-dimensional. And, um, and now it's more two-dimensional work. But um, I like what you said about the magic when you create a piece of artwork and it really speaks to somebody. Um, there'll be times when I'm creating artwork and and I know specifically who's going to be buying it, whether I've met them or not. But um, And my partner sometimes will go, who's going to buy that? And I'm like, there's the, per the perfect person out there who's going to buy that one. Um, so, yeah, there's just, yeah, there's something about every piece. There's somebody's home and somebody who it really speaks to. So... Yeah, and if they don't speak to anybody, there's always the opportunity to recycle it. There you go. <laughs> right? Just paint over it. Yeah. In my case, I kind of tear things off, and then I'll put things back on it. But. I had a, um, a customer one time that she commissioned me to do a, a painting of a, um, a rabbit sitting around a campfire roasting marshmallows. <laughs> and it was kind of an odd um, uh, format. It was a little bit long because it was going to um, be underneath her cupboards in her kitchen. And it was going to be in a specific place, so it had some specific dimensions that I was going to um, have to paint it in and so I did the painting and sent it to her she lived in Portland and um, you know she I didn't hear from her and then she called me about a week later and goes I don't like this painting sent it back <laughs> and, I, and I just was pissed you know it was you know it didn't match her cupboards that was the the problem with it. And so, you know, I had this painting, it was framed up, and it sat in my studio, and every time I look at it, I'd get mad. And I had a friend come to my studio. And she saw that painting, and she started to cry. And 
it was uh, something her father and her had done. And it was so, um, it was so, she was the person that needed that painting. You know, I didn't paint it for that person in Portland. I painted it for this other other person, and um, she eventually got it, uh, the painting. And it was the the perfect um, home for this painting. Mm -hmm. And you know, thank goodness that person didn't it didn't speak to her, and that it didn't match her cupboards <laughs> because it wasn't meant for her. Right. Yeah. And, you know, the, the rightful owner showed up. Yeah. So it does, you know, um, I, I used to, when I would create images, I would always um, worry about, is this going to sell? I, I mean, I, this is how I make my, my living, doing paintings. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, when I first started, Painting in Portland, everybody was painting howling coyotes, and I thought, <laughs> "Oh, I got to paint how, howling coyotes," and that wasn't me. I, I'm not a howling coyote painter, but I thought that that's what I had to do. And so um, I would uh, every show I would do paintings that I thought people would buy, but then I would always do about five or so paintings that I would paint for myself. I didn't care if anybody bought them or not. And then, you know, the show would get hung. Those paintings that I painted for myself, they sold quicker than the other ones did. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, you know, I, I need to be true to myself when I do these paintings. And I need to paint for me. Mm -hmm. And people will then appreciate that more I think and uh, not every painting do I um, more and more in this I'm learning is it's more important to me um, and I get more satisfaction out of painting them than the end product mm -hmm. it's more about the process now right. it's not about a product or the finished painting I, I can turn these over to somebody else to dust and look at them. Mm -hmm. When I'm done painting with them, done painting, I'm done with them. I don't need to, I have none of my own artwork on my walls at home. It's all mm -hmm. other people's artwork. I, I just don't need to continue to look at these paintings. It's nice to go to somebody's home and see an old painting that, that is there that I've done in the past, but um, you know, it's, I don't need to hang on to them. Right. It's like seeing so. an old friend. It is. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's something that you've had this relationship with mm -hmm. for 12 hours or right. two days or however long it was. And it is like going and finding an old friend again. Right. Somebody posted on Facebook a piece of artwork they found at the Goodwill. And she's like, is this yours? I'm like, wow, I love that piece. I'm so glad it's back in circulation. <laughs> I've ended up in Goodwill, too. And, yeah. I, and I, have, I have found some masterpieces in Goodwill. <laughs> so, um, you know, I don't know if that's a... But I'm a treasure hunter. Right. And, you know, and I appreciate it when um, there is treasure to be found out there and... Um, I like what you said about you're trying to use up your old materials and get rid of things because of trying to simplify. And I have a lot of tin cans and bottle caps. And so I've tried to eliminate, I don't go and look for tin cans anymore and no longer do I sh go to Goodwill to drag home materials. But um, people still drop them off on me. But my goal is to use up all of my material before I die. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to make it, but it is a goal. I have that same goal. Right. <laughs> yeah, we probably will never finish all the ideas we have. What's an idea that you're um, thinking of doing once you get out of here? Well, I, 
you know, at the beginning of COVID, I, I, had, a, I had a hard time starting to paint again. And mm. I was in Vietnam on, I came back on February 9th wow. of 2020. 2020. Mm -hmm. And it was already starting to heat up over in Asia. And um, so I think we could officially, for myself, COVID officially started March 17th when mm -hmm. my coffee shop hangout closed. And then slowly, you know, our freedoms were taken away a little at a time. Um, you know, live music stopped. Um, I stopped traveling. And I started, after a while, I said, I got to do something positive. And so I started painting again. And I, you know, remember Michelle Obama talking about having a kind of a low grade depression. And I think a lot of people have that. And I certainly think that I was in that category too, that I was not, you know, it just wasn't, things weren't right. And things had not been right even before COVID. And we have a, we're on a five year run of bad stuff happening, I, in my opinion. So I, I started painting and I, I'm always a believer that, um, you know, I get to choose what I think about. Mm -hmm. I, I always have that. Um, and that um, I create my, I'm responsible for my happiness. Right. I'm not going to let anybody take charge of that. I'm going to, that's my job. So I started painting again. And one of the uh, pandemic projects I took on, I had had all these old drawings. Some went back as far as high school. And uh, there, were, I went through these portfolios of old drawings, and um, I then started framing about 250 of them. And so that was a big project. I've never had a framing project that that large. And then I started designing projects that would, like Lauren and I have both said, to use up these materials that were around the house. I, I kind of assessed what I had and then designed projects to use them in. I also committed to about three or four shows. Um, you know, I, had, I have about three days off between this show and the next one in November. And <laughs> I will just continue working um, during this time, there, there's no, uh, I, I'm happiest when I'm, um, when my life is out of balance, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is, I, I, I can't say it any other way. I just, I, I admit it. Hmm. For, for me, COVID was actually, um, it must be the Pollyanna aspect of me because it was just like, who doesn't want to stay home for two months and work on their artwork? <laughs> it was like, stay home in the studio, sure, no problem. Nobody's coming over. So I kind of had that reverse response to COVID. I just was happy to be hanging out at home, working on projects. Um, oh, there was something else you said, but now I can't remember what it was. Um, yeah, just using up materials. Um, what's ahead for you? What's ahead for me? Oh, right. So um, I'm very excited. My partner and I like to go to the ocean and gather up plastic, just throw it in the garbage. But um, <laughs> clean up the beaches, if you will. But um, there's also all these little small pieces of brightly colored plastic. It's the new glass beach plastic, it's small little pieces. So I've been collecting that, and they also have these gigantic floats that come ashore. There used to be glass ones, but now they have these plastic ones with their giant beads, a big hole. 
So I found this one, it was about eight inches in diameter, and I figured out how to scale the, the map of the world onto it. And so I drew the map of the world onto it, and I'm going to take all these colorful bits of plastic and cover this gigantic bead and have this plastic world. <laughs> so that's one of my projects that I'm looking forward to. Very good. And I like, and it is, it's kind of like when I'm doing the projects that, you know, it's just like that I really want to do, it's, I'm much happier then than if I'm trying to do a commission for somebody that's, that doesn't speak to me. But um, it's always the ones that are trying to get together a body of work to do a show is also kind of time consuming. Whereas if I get to do these crazy projects that really have, they're bloody, I mean, they, they're very time consuming, some of the projects I want to do. And, um, but I have much more fun doing those than, than trying to create a body of work for a show or something like that. So the sphere of plastic is what I'm looking forward to. So a very specific piece of work. So they moved that art supply store to the beach, huh? Ah, uh, yeah, that's the other problem. It's got to be very careful about how much plastic comes into the studio because that can overwhelm the place too. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I think that, um, you know, generally uh, artists are collectors mm -hmm. and they see the whole world as being nothing but raw material to do something else with. Right. And I saw a, um, has anybody seen this little book called Steel Like an Artist? Oh, I love that book. I've, I've used it as a uh, textbook for my painting classes mm -hmm. because there's so much great information mm -hmm. in there. It's all about where we get our ideas and inspiration for what we do. And Picasso said there's only two types of ideas. Mm -hmm. One's worth stealing and one's that aren't worth stealing. <laughs> and that is, you know, there's really nothing new under the sun, and we just um, have variations on a theme. We, right. we have our influences, and then we, um, here, and they suggest that we find out who their influences were, and we're just one more branch of that tree. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm a fan of Wayne Tebow hmm. and uh, I love him and he was one of my heroes throughout my painting career and you know he just passed away a few months ago and he painted up to his last day he was 101 hmm. when he died wow. and uh, I learned so much from from him I he taught me how to paint shadows along with Edward Hopper and Mm -hmm. um, but uh, um, I think that um, you know the the creative process is something that um, we're we're always refining, mm -hmm. and that it's always um, um, a, this relationship with the artist to their materials. Mm -hmm and finding the right materials to do whatever we have envisioned with. And, um, you know, I had a friend that they went to art school and one of their art classes, the first day of class, they sent them out into the world and said, you know, find all your art materials. And they painted with sticks and mud puddle water. And it was really a great exercise for them just to think outside the box hmm. and to see the potential of of creating beauty from anything and that's a really good right. good, good project I remember one of the projects that I enjoyed from art school was um, the, the teacher said go out and find a piece of nature just whatever you find just find a piece of nature and bring it in and so people would come in with a flower or they'd come in with a twig or something like that. And then he'd say, look at this piece of nature and parse out how much of what color is present. So if you had a flower, it was predominantly pink, it had a little bit of yellow, it had this small dash of white and it had this some green and there were different levels of green. And he'd have you just draw it in lines so that you had like 100% and like this much is pink with variations. and. And then 
after you completed that, the artist, the teacher would then say, if you created a piece of artwork with these proportions, you would have a very pleasing piece of artwork because it comes from nature. So it's not that you had to paint the, 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 um, the flower. You could paint a city scene, but if you kept the proportions similar to that piece of nature, it would be, it would be a work of art. And I was like, oh my, I just loved that idea. It's still something that resonates. It's the idea of proportions and the right amount because nature doesn't make any mistakes. It's this perfect. And you're a Fibonacci sequence person. Right, it's similar to that probably. Mm -hmm. You're not a believer in the Fibonacci. <laughs> can tell. You still don't ask me to sell it or spell it. Right. <laughs> Should we take some questions? Does sure. anyone have questions? Yes. Uh, for you, Max, I'm just curious about your process when you create a painting, like, for example, the robot um, in the cityscape. Do you start from a sketch? And also, do you have a color palette in mind before you start, or is it something that evolves? Good questions. Um, the process uh, I do, I do very simple um, drawings onto the board in maybe pencil. A lot of times I'll draw out with a dark color of paint with a smaller brush and sketch out that way. I don't spend an awful lot of time in the, um, um, the, the, the idea is pretty much there from the beginning. And then um, it's kind of like a coloring book then. I, it's very intuitive how I choose sections to be certain colors. I only use probably, I don't know, 25, 30 different colors um, over and over again. And I don't mix a lot of paint either. It's all pretty much out of the tube. And um, so it's... Uh, I do have to, on the, the ensuing colors, um, I have to um, make changes as to things that are close in value and they're not showing up, or, you know, two colors that are just not working together. And so it's a, a, a not an awful lot of changes that happen after the original concept has been, been started. Um, has anybody seen a great film called The Mystery of Picasso? And it's a film from the early 50s, and Picasso, um, the, the, it's filmed by um, Renoir's uh, grandson, is the cinematographer. And it shows Picasso drawing on glass with felt tip pens, and he's commenting on the the drawing and what you get from this film, at least I get from it, is a, a sense of what his process is, how he thinks about um, building an image. The second half of the film is all speeded up time-lapse photography of him painting. And it is magical. Mm -hmm. That guy was not attached to anything. <laughs> and it was just, if it wasn't working, you know, he just started painting something else. This one painting he does at the last of the film, he changes 200 times. It starts out as a base scene and he sticks a little speedboat out there with a guy water skiing behind it. Then it turns into a bullfight. And then, <laughs> um, you know, it turns into a reclining nude and then it it's a villa and it just, it doesn't matter to him um, he and I tell my painting students that um, there's a time when your reference or your idea is no longer valid that the painting tells you what to do mm -hmm. it's not the it's not your idea anymore and you're just there to paint it and if you know how to listen to your painting it'll tell you what needs to happen to it so that's um, that's kind of how I work. 
and uh, once again, subject matter is just an excuse to do a painting. Yeah. Any other questions? Do you still have a discipline? Do you, you know, have a regular work day, schedule, time period where no matter what, you, this is when I do my art? I do not. Mine's pretty, it's pretty random. I also have a day job, so that has a schedule. I'm an acupuncturist, but, um, and the art gets fitted in around that. So, but yeah, I, I don't know. I think it would be very interesting to have a scheduled life in art, but I'm not sure how it would work. I, I pretty much paint every day. I try to paint every mm -hmm. day and I get cranky if I don't get to paint. Mm -hmm. I do I'm, get cranky if I have not been in the studio for a while. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it's, um, I also, I'm a, I'm a swing shift guy. <laughs> you know, there's, there's no art made before noon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there, there's also no art sold before noon either. <laughs> so um, I kind of like to slowly come to in the morning and, uh, and then about Oh, noon or so, I'll start painting. I'll work till seven o'clock at night. And, mm -hmm. um, and I would prefer um, doing a lot of things in a day's time rather than just one thing. And mm -hmm. that's a, a, a characteristic of an extrovert. Introverts only like to do one thing at a time. They like to hmm. get it done, then move on to the next process. Extroverts like to multitask, and I'll be doing the laundry, I'll be painting, I'll be huh. doing, I'll be watching <laughs> the news or something, all at the same time. And that's heaven to me to do that. I must be a pseudo extrovert. I thought I was an introvert, but I definitely like doing a lot of things at one time yeah, like that. Yeah. But yeah, doing one thing at a time, oh boy. Such a waste of time. Oh, I know. Like my taxes I'm working on right now. More I yeah. can stand that for about five minutes. <laughs> and then, you know, and I can do anything for five minutes, I figure. Right. I have a 12 minute, 12 minutes. The highest mountains are climbed one step at a time. Mm -hmm. He's got some good one liners. Doesn't he? That's and why he's a, a teacher. Bunch of them. <laughs> you, need, you need to publish a book like Austin Cleon. Steal like an artist. <laughs> Well, he stole all the good lines right. already, so but I do like to quote him. Yeah. Yes, Deborah. Question for you, Max. Do you, can you describe your earliest memory of being drawn to painting? Anything that sticks out in your mind? Well, there is a, a memory that certainly has stuck with me, and, and it relates to a lot of, about teaching as well and um, it was a memory from kindergarten and when I draw or paint I spin my paper around so I work on it upside down and then I'll turn it 90 degrees and I'll work on it a little bit mm -hmm. like this <coughs> and my kindergarten teacher she chastised me for doing that and scolded me and wanted, you can't, you can't be turning your paper all the time. And, um, you know, that turned out to be, you know, Pretty not that one's better than the other, but she was a kindergarten teacher. I'm an artist. Right. And, um, <laughs> you know, she tried to make me be something that I wasn't. And you've probably, I've taken a few art classes where the teacher wanted me to, to be them. Oh. Not take what I already do and make what I do better. <laughs> or improve upon what I do as a, a, with my look. Um, I mean, how I had a, a teacher when I went, I first made an attempt to go to community college. I last, lasted about 
a couple months, I think. And the teacher, he was a Escher guy. He loved Escher, and this was a drawing composition class. And we would study compositions of famous paintings, and then, but he said, you know, if I couldn't draw like he did, which was like Escher did, these very fine gradations of, of different pencils, no, can't see any pencil strokes, I end up with more lead on me than I do on the paper. I'm not, <laughs> that's not me. And he, he was going to flunk me because I couldn't do that. And, but my compositions were beautiful. And, you know, I got what created a good composition. But he wanted me to be him. Okay. I wasn't interested, it turned out. And I did, didn't have the, the um, maturity to call him on it either. I just assumed that, well, it just made one more thing that made me feel bad about myself hmm. at that time. So when, my, when I teach painting to adults, I kind of assess what they do already and then remove the obstacles that, that keeps them from getting better with, um, with their painting. It's all about problem solving, you know, making art. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you have a blank canvas, blank piece of paper, you start putting marks on it, you got problems. And then when all the problems are fixed, your painting's done. Simple as that. So, you know, you have to know what those problems are and, and identify them. Who were some of your influences or heroes mm. or heroines in, in, Toys. in the art world? In the art world, that's a challenge. You know, I went to art school, but I never learned art speak very well. Um, I was Googling things as I tried to come up with something. If you really want to see some really cool bottle cap artwork, check out the Wolves, the Woolsleys. So, um, Woolsleys? Woolsleys. They did some really amazing sculptures in the 1960s and 70s in mm. bottle caps. Um, it, I guess I'm influenced by things. Um, art world-wise... Um, I don't know, I mean, we take art history, right? And you had to do all those art history classes, and there were so many Jesuses and people with halos. I really like halos. <laughs> Put halos in things. Um, yeah, crowns. crowns. Yeah. I mean, crowns. Um, it's, it's a hard one for me to come up with names. I mean, I don't even know movie stars very well, or rock stars, or I just didn't file names very well. Um, I mean, like one of my first memories when I was a kid was taking Smarties candies wrappers. You know, Smarties are these like little pill-like um, candies that are wrapped in cellophane. Mm. And I liked the way the cellophane, you could twist it and look like wings. So then I was like, oh, I'll make a dragonfly. So I made a dragonfly out of Smartie wrappers. Mm. Um, just, yeah, things inspire me, kind of the, the way things are shaped. Um, things made in other countries where they're using recycled material and reusing things is very inspirational. Um, I liked Calder, there you go, Art yeah, World. Yeah. Calder did some three-dimensional wire garbage contraptions. He did a circus that was pretty, pretty fun. There was a video of him oh, working a circus that's pretty fun. He's hilarious. on the floor. He's